Once someone tries it, they want it. They're not going to come back and they're not going to return the product. Very high ticket items being sold, mm -hmm. but the customer has full ability to make that experience for them pay off. Hi Raj, thanks for joining us today to talk about technology and retail. Thank you. So we wanted to start today by talking about uh, Travis Perkins um, and they've uh, revealed that they're making good progress against the ambitious science-based decarbonisation targets. The way that businesses are kind of trying to change their, their corporate structures, the way that they do business, to really focus on this real request from customers, from end users, to try and move towards a more decarbonized society, yeah. I think is really interesting. There's a lot of ambitious targets out there to achieve those. Technology is really one of the key drivers to make that happen. Have you seen anything interesting? Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, to be fair, I think carbon footprint for everybody is important. It's important in business and personal life. Mm. Um, carbon footprint targets are great to set, but you have to be able to achieve them. So I think, you know, from our perspective, you know, particularly providing technology, mm. we use that technology to ensure that, you know, our carbon footprint, our sustainability strategies can all be measured. So yeah. if you look at some of the technology that comes out within our IoT business, mm -hmm. the sensors, the way that we can manage our time, um, we also are working with our partners to reduce deliveries. Yeah, That's a real key part. So we encourage our partners now to go with ship completes. Yep. We incentivize them so we're not shipping multiple times. And obviously that helps with our footprint. Mm. And obviously certainly transport cost as a whole reduces and in line with the carbon footprint. So I think as we move across, the businesses are all going to focus on it. Yeah, absolutely. As they are now. And I think the targets will get more aggressive. Yeah. yeah. And as they should do, really. I think actually on this one, the support that we've had from our life cycle business has been really interesting. When I was writing our awards for this year's entries, there's some fantastic numbers in there talking about how we're reducing carbon from the system, reducing waste. And I think the life cycle services is a really important part of the channel, something that everyone is trying to invest in and get more involved in. Being able to add that to any business is a super valuable offering. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. And I think, you know, the, the, the term life cycle is the most prevalent part of it. Yeah. You know, making sure that the cycle of start to finish, we look at that carbon footprint. Mm. And that's exactly what that business does very well. Yeah, absolutely. Tommy Hilfiger is um, entering the circular economy with rent or buy schemes as well. So that's something that's kind of... Been... I think this is a really interesting one. Yeah. So I, before we were on camera, we were talking a little bit about like renting and buying clothes. I think... For me, a renting scheme is a really interesting way of owning a garment. Especially with the design of brands as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think maybe if you're going to an awards night or something like that and you need something to maybe stand out, that may be an option. There's a, there's a whole piece around that kind of ownership though. I think clothes have a lot of intrinsic value to people. Yeah. But I think probably the most interesting thing is how do you keep reselling that product? How do you maybe skew it up? How do you manage the logistics of that? What happens if that item is late and needs to be sold on to someone? How does that sort of model work? Yeah, and I think, to be fair, I think it all goes down to what the total cost of ownership is for not just the consumer, but also the business that's offering the scheme. Yeah. Now, I think clothing is quite unique in that, in that sense because if you look from a retailer's perspective, it's a high margin item. Mm -hmm. If you can refresh that item consistently yeah. and the model that you've got in place is very, let's say, you know, consumer friendly, mm then I think technology drives the ability to be able to rent anything. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. You know, clothes is an interesting one, so it's going to be very interesting how Tommy Hilfiger go with that because mm. I think, you know, we've all grown up, you know, under peer pressure to be able to have designer clothes. Yep. You know, oh, it's yeah. not always possible, but at the same time, I'm sure we're all used to renting a suit or a tuxedo yep. because we need to wear it once or twice a year. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that sometimes designer clothing is exactly the same way. So... Certainly going to be keeping an eye on how Tommy Hilfiger goes there because yeah. I think yeah. that can actually be the future of a lot of items that we just think we need to go and buy. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, the ability to measure it through technology is going to be invaluable. So, you know, some of the some of the uh, technology they're using to analyze this yep. is going to be really interesting with the data it spits out. Yeah, completely. And they're not the only ones as well. John Lewis had partnered with Children's Wear, um, a rental platform to actually, was it the Little Loop, to yeah. actually do the exact same thing. And uh, I've got a two-year-old and I've got another one expected uh, soon as well. So mm. there's that kind of quick sort of turnaround with children's clothes. I can actually see this kind of 
being a really good idea because you think, oh great, we could just get you know some more clothes in, rent them, not have to spend the price up front. But then you think, how many times has this been around yeah. with children's wear? Like how clean is it? Things like that. Like what's the life cycle there? They had that on Dragon's Den, uh, mm -hmm. the Little Loop. It's an interesting company, interesting founder as well. I think with children's clothes, and I think actually with any kind of rental scheme, it's that uh, the responsibility side. It's if you're kind of buying into this, are you buying into it because you just want a cheap option for clothing? Or are you maybe focused on more the sustainability side? And I think if you're focused maybe more on the, the implication, the ethical implication of that product, then maybe you treat it better, you look after it, you're maybe more responsible and more more trustable as a customer. Yeah. So I think that really can add to it. It's more about how brands build these platforms and build these systems using good technology to make it as easy and seamless as possible to have that experience. I think, absolutely, I think sustainability here is the key. Um, you know, talking from previous experiences, you know, you're basically from, from zero to certainly two to three years old. Mm. You know, they shoot up, they yeah. grow so quickly. The fact is you are yeah. absolutely, mm. you know, damaging the environment because you're consistently buying new clothes and then consistently having to dispose of them yeah you know yeah. because you can't find somebody that can use them mm -hmm. this is a great scheme because to be fair you really only need to keep a set of clothing for a few months yeah so if you can have a longevity of, of doing that then i think one the cost of ownership for the individual certainly in the current climate where we all know mm. you know living expenses are really high yeah adding to a newborn in the family is even yeah. higher yeah this is yeah. this is great and you know i certainly absolutely believe that this will be the future as we go through certainly maybe our generation but certainly our next generations they'll this will be normal for them yeah you know yeah. We're, yeah. while we're all learning to think do i really want to rent a piece of clothing it'd be nothing to the, the next generation yeah. that no. will be what they do yeah, yeah completely agree stepping away from that sort of disposability of almost everything and sort of making a longevity to things great Kind of gives me a lot of hope, I think, for <laughs> yeah, the future, yeah. definitely. It's very optimistic. So I think some of our next stories, we're talking a little bit more about kind of experiential retail. I think we've got some really interesting stuff. Yeah, about. yeah. Dyson's unveiled its second UK store at the Trafford Centre in Manchester, which is great because it's not just, look how great how vacuum cleaners are. They've actually got a whole suite of, uh, of demonstrations of things they can show off their technology with, which is really cool. Yeah. I think this one's wicked. So I remember when the Apple store opened really locally to us, and that was, for me, the first time I really experienced an experience in retail. Yeah. It was all about kind of getting hands-on. You had experts on one particular topic. I think it was... Uh, a way that you could get really immersed into it. So instead of having to go to a till, you could walk around with the Apple staff, you could kind of get hands on. They had their iPhones with the scanners in, so you could buy a product on the move. Yeah. For me, that was really cool. It was about really experiencing the products and knowing what I was kind of taking home. For me, that then changed maybe my buying habit a little bit. I was more incentivized to go into store, oh, yeah. try it out. Uh you know, I think what, what Dyson have done is very, very clever because, you know, to, to have a retail environment is expensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But also to have product being returned is more expensive. Yeah. yeah. So I think what they've done is incredibly, you know, I wouldn't go as far as saying they've copied the Apple route, but with, with what they've done now, the ability to go in and actually use the product, you know, they've got that environment of being able to wash your hair. Yeah. Try, try the straightener, yeah. try the, uh, the hair dryer. What that does is very clever. Once someone tries it, they want it. Yep. They're not going to come back and they're not going to return the product. Yeah. So again, you know, we talk about sustainability and everything else. Absolutely, which means less packaging being used, less yep. packaging being disposed of, yeah. very high ticket items being sold, mm -hmm. but the customer has full ability to make that experience for them pay off. Yeah. So I think it's certainly, you know, Dyson will do that across the UK. I think yeah. these experiments... You know, these experience stores are going to be what we see pop up a lot more now. Yeah. Um, certainly. And I think it's great for everybody in the uh, technology environment mm. because we can actually see these stores using the immersive technology and the experience yeah. that we all are trying to encourage everybody to use. So, you know, great stuff to see that happening. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think this is probably not, it's not a new concept at all. Like if you think about the, the good food shows and stuff like that, mm. yeah. where people have always showcased kind of products and seen them kind of come to life a little bit. Maybe you've got a celebrity chef using your latest T-Fell pan. That I think is a concept that only existed in like moments in time. You'd go to one event for one very specific thing and then that was it done and dusted. You couldn't see it for the rest of the year. I think customer experience has just shifted completely down to instant moments. People don't want to wait for things. They want to see it come to life right at that point. 
it's almost like a response to the, the sort of looking online for the reviews on something. But if you haven't experienced it, if you haven't actually picked it up and seen how it works, yeah. a lot of the time, well, I know I have. I've looked at something, oh, actually, no, I won't get it this time because I don't know exactly what it's like. Yeah. But you go to one of these experiences, you go, oh, wow, look how much better this is than whatever product I was using before yeah. or that I don't even have. Yeah, it's going to be a great step up, definitely. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And um, M&S has also unveiled uh, a list and go uh, new augmented reality app, which is sort of allowing uh, customers to know where exactly in a store they need to go for things, which looks really cool. So I know I've definitely been on my own, gone to a shop. And I just need this. I just need to find it. And I've walked up and down the aisles over and over again. So this is going to be really helpful. I'm, the amount of times I've needed to go into uh, M&S and mm -hmm. try and you're trying to track down like some oregano or maybe some toothpaste or something like that. So trying to track down a product is a big kind of bugbear of mine. So I think having maybe a way of getting quick directions to that maybe means that I'm spending a little bit less time in store but enjoying that experience in yeah, store a hell of a lot that. more. Yeah, yeah definitely. And I, and I think, you know, I think in, in, in this environment, particularly with the Marks and Spencers, you know, study itself, it's, I think it's not about Marks and Spencers wanting people to spend more time in their store. Mm. I think literally is the fact that the more convenience that they can provide, the more people are going to come back. Yeah. And I think, you know, with the, with the app and the way it works is I think, you know, most people can plan their journey into Marks and Spencers very easily. Yeah. yeah. Go through, do what they need to do and get, gives them more time potentially to look around other parts of Marks and Spencers, which yeah. is what I think they've, you know, they're trying yeah. to achieve that, yeah. which is don't want you spending a hundred minutes of your day trying to find everything you need. Mm -hmm. Here it is, and then you can spend some time looking around the rest of the store. So I think, Definitely. you know, from, you know, the technology that they're using to drive this, you know, it's, it's capable of being more widespreadly used across all sorts of environments, mm. but this will be a great trial to see how uh, the customer experience improves. I think this kind of leads really nicely into kind of scan and go technology as well. Well, you've just got to think, you know, in, in the fact that if you look at, you know, our own Ingram Micro Data Capture point of sale business, yeah. you know, we've done a lot of work enabling the end user to be able to do that. So you look mm. at the, the big stores like Tesco's, mm. as the John Lewis, certainly Waitrose partnership, they're all trying to reduce the, the amount of POS they have systems and have it more scan and go. Yeah. yeah. So you know, Cut out the sticking points. Absolutely. Just make it as quick, click and clean as possible. And also that technology is foolproof, so it's very secure, you know, it's, it's easy and you can pretty much, you know, scan and go on every single item. It doesn't have to be yeah. limited to the value. So yeah. even with televisions or anything else you can do. So it, it literally is one, you know, stores looking at the customer experience, but stores also looking at where they can invest, you know, a better experience by having less people as staff and more staff actually knowing what they're talking about yeah. rather yeah. than being able to help you process it. Yeah, yeah definitely. And actually with, with AR kind of developing, um, Amazon's also ventured into this with, uh, with virtual try-on shoes, okay. which I think is pretty fun. So you could just sort of hold your uh, phone up to your feet and see what the new, uh, yeah. new sneakers will look like or something. Yeah, it looks pretty cool. I mean, yeah. for me, this is a big thing. So yeah, I yeah. trainers, I think, are some of the hardest things that you can buy online because your feet are always different in every yeah. pair of shoes. So the amount of times I've bought a pair of shoes online, when they arrive, they look crazy as hell. <laughs> I think I'm always trying to experiment, trying to get past like a black or white shoe, maybe do something a little bit different. Yeah. But every time it turns up and it's way too bold. But I think what's really been interesting is when these are actually implemented in stores. So instead of having um, a whole floor covered in all of your products, from a security perspective, even from a logistics perspective, making sure they're continuously replenished. Mm. I think being able to maybe go into a store, experience the product just sitting down, make your decision then, and then have someone very quickly bring it over to you in the right size, go straight to the till, you check out, it's your product right at that moment. I think there's a lot of uh, logistics built into the back of that. There's a hell of a lot of pause that is needed to get that right. But I think that is a really interesting experience for me. And I've, I've seen that in a few stores that are kind of popping up mm -hmm. where you're able to experience a product, but very quickly kind of check out, get out of the store and get on with the rest of your day. Yeah. Yeah. I think trainers is a, it, it's an interest because, I've you know, uh, historically I've always done it with glasses, you know, okay. when you, prescription glasses, when you need them, you do. But I think with trainers, I think what, what this will do is I can see now a lot, a lot more trainers being individu individually designed. Yeah, like personal. So therefore... Yeah. With these yeah. apps, you know, because you can see, you know, it's an expensive purchase for sure. You know, so I think that the ability now for consumers to be able to design their trainers to look very unique to them yeah. mm. and then be able to place that order, like you said, as long as, you know, the likes of 
you know the big brands have got the infrastructure behind it to be able to make sure that journey's seamless yeah so you order online you go in store you then try it pick it up yeah you know it's it's a it's a great experience for something that's very expensive to purchase um and of course when it's bespoke you can't return it yeah. so you need to make sure you've designed it yes. exactly how you want it mm -hmm. you know what it's going to look like on your feet you yeah know, for sure you know i think it's going to be i think again it's great that you know the whole virtual reality, the augmented reality, it's going to be more and more across all of our customer journeys moving mm. forward. Yeah. So next up, we're going to talk a little bit about how data is changing the way that retail works. Yeah, yeah. Um, Google uh, Google Cloud has announced a new partnership with global fashion giant H&M Group, mm. um, where the alliance, the alliance will see the retailer leverage Google Cloud's data analytics capabilities and global infrastructure to further enhance its customer experience and supply chain enablement. That retail journey, if you look at it specifically for retail, mm. it's it, it's about analysing and understanding behaviours. Well, everybody has a separate and a different behaviour when you go in store, yeah. and I think this is where data becomes, you know, king. Being able to you know access that data via the cloud, yeah. But more importantly, allowing the consumer in the store to interact with the store. Yeah. So you've got so many different technologies, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, everything that says. It's not about me just going into a store to buy something. Mm. I want to have fun with that experience. Yeah. And that fun is all about imparting data to the retailer to allow you to have the fun. Yeah. And I think that the, 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 the partnership that Google have just announced, mm. it is not just about being able to use the data to, you know, for a better word, spam yeah. the customer. It's to understand that customer Definitely. and make sure that their journey within store or online yeah. is very representative of them. Yes. And I think this is the only, this is how data will drive that behavior. Definitely. I think we're really seeing that data is only as good as what you do with it. Yeah. And businesses have had data for years and years and years. Before digitalization, there was tons and tons of data. But it's how you utilize that data to really make that difference. And I think whether that's implementing it to create a better experience in store, maybe more streamline, maybe use that to build better technology to enable your customers to interact with you. So whether that is using online data to find out that an AR experience is going to be the best way that a customer can experience a product. Or maybe that is looking at footfall data using um, a camera system that you've got implemented yeah. in your stores to maybe put your products in better place, better merchandise that store. I think using data is incredibly important, but using it right, like you're saying, is super yeah. important. From a marketing perspective, I think using data is a fantastic way of understanding your customers, creating a more personalized experience for them. Yeah. So making sure that you're using that data in ethical ways, in ways that allow the customer to feel like they're included as opposed to being creeped on, I think yeah. is very yeah. important. Well, I think you look at the, you know, you look at the Amazon experience, you know, and everybody at the outset was, you know, Amazon is just in my life everywhere. Yeah. But right now, I think most consumers want Amazon in their life everywhere because they are reminding them of things. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, when yeah. you go online and you you obviously search because you need something, mm. but you don't necessarily go and buy it there and then. You know, Absolutely. I, I think as Max said, you know, sometimes I'll leave it for now and I'll get it later. Yeah. But that's what the data is telling Amazon. Say, well, you did need it, so let me remind you yeah. that yeah. you do need it. And I think that's where the consumer journey is much better now than it has ever has been mm. because of the way that data is used by the retailers. Yeah. Definitely. You don't feel like you're being hounded for the wrong things. You're actually being reminded of the right things, which yeah. is the best way to do it. Yeah. Helpful over hindrance, I think, is yeah. super important. Definitely. We all need to think about that. So coming off the back of the last few years, which have been incredibly difficult for, I think, all of us, we've seen a real kind of requirement and a, a need for retail to maybe change and evolve to better support customers. I think we've got some really interesting stories. Yeah, about yeah. So um, during the pandemic, the co-op warned that violence towards its staff had skyrocketed 140%, um, while workers' union USDAW saw them, said that violence towards um, and abuse sorry, towards retail workers had doubled since the start of the pandemic. Um, so it's uh, calling for new laws to protect its staff, but also using new technology to do that as well. So, Yeah, you know, I, th I think, you know, we use that term frontline worker now, and I think, you know, a lot of people just, you know, took it for granted. But yeah. their jobs, their roles, you know, throughout the last few years have been incredibly difficult. And as we move to the next few years, they're going to be, they're going to be asked to do different things that, you know, sometimes increase people's frustrations. Mm. So, you know, I, I think the fact that what co-op have done is absolutely just seen that that's the case and made the right investment in terms of 
you know, one, how they protect their staff, mm. yeah. but also how they, again, enhance the experience of the customer. Yeah. Because you can reduce frustrations by making sure that that experience is right in the first place. So, you know, some of the technology we're now seeing, you know, certainly, you know, the co-op with the lead that they've done, but again, in a lot of different environments is, is the body worn Mm. Uh, camera element. Yeah. 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 Now people see that and get a little bit phased in the fact that you know I'm being permanently record recorded. Yeah. But I think with the b body worn technology, it's a little bit different because it's not recording; it's live streaming. Yeah. Okay. Right. And what live st streaming does is, of course, it protects everybody, mm. and it's real time. But at the same time, it also can you know send a lot of data back to wherever it needs to in terms of. For example, the co-op HQ, the co-op security centre, yeah. or even the co-op logistics centre in looking at behaviours and everything else. So, you know, though the technology can be a little bit, you know, resentful yeah. to a consumer right now, but I think as 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 more people use it, the journey for that consumer will be better because their experience will be seen in the eyes of a lot of people, yeah. and therefore the frustration levels will come down. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And I think a lot of these innovations that we've been talking about today have kind of evolved through the last few years. Yeah where we've seen lots of barriers have to be put in place, whether that's wearing masks or having to sanitize, all of those sorts of things have added additional barriers. So technology has been an interesting way to maybe take out some of the old historic barriers that were in place that now don't necessarily need to be. So whilst we've added a few for hygiene reasons, maybe we can take a few out, mm. which I think we're kind of seeing. And hopefully that's making some impact in lots yeah. of areas. Yeah, we've actually had, uh, speaking of keeping things like sanitized as well, there's been uh, a little innovation here that I think is amazing. It's sort of so simple, you'd think, why hadn't we thought of it before? Yeah. But it's um, it's new moving buttons, okay. so on screen. So um, basically the technology can allow up to 50 people to use a self-checkout before it actually needs cl um, cleaning, so instead of every individual person. Yeah. The idea being that the, the little button to sort of move next or to sort of continue is always different for every different customer, which I think is a, a very elegant solution, actually, which uh, works well. Yeah, and I think, do you know what, I think, it, again, it just it, it just enhances your experience because, let's be honest, we're all used to the checkout being right at the bottom. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, you end up checking out way before you really need to because you've still got other things to scan. So I think the fact that, you know, the attention to detail is still there because the, th the buttons are moving around. Mm. Yes, it helps with the sanitization and keeping the technology clean, but at the same time, I think it just engages consumers more because Definitely. at the end of the day, it's not a mundane process of scan and check out. It's a yeah. case of you know, interacting with the technology, which is there for your own use anyway. So, you know, I think the whole technology in retail is going to enhance. Mm. I think the experience, you know, that, that's, that's a quirky story, but I, there are more quirkier stories than that with the technology that are being used. So I think, you know, as we all go through that retail evolution, I think we're going to find it more exciting with the latest technology being rolled out across these environments. Yeah, yeah completely agree. I think it's just those small little innovations that make the massive difference. Yeah. One retail experience that I really like is um, where you're kind of placing the product into maybe like a, a designated area. It's got scales and a camera, so you don't even have to scan a product anymore. It knows exactly what that product is. Oh, wow. It's in a popular retail mm -hmm. sports store just oh, up the right, road. Yes. <laughs> but for me, that's a fantastic experience of so just kind of yeah. dropping my products in. feels a little bit kind of like futuristic for me. I, I, I don't know how intelligent the technology is that actually runs it, but... That is a seamless experience for me. I'm kind of just throwing all of my products in one by one, bag them all up, and then I'm out. There's mm. nothing worse than when you're kind of like scanning a product, you put it on the scales, doesn't quite register, you have to then put it back through. Lift it, put it back down, still doesn't register. Yeah, very like, frustrating. Yeah. And I think this is, again, it's, you know, a lot of people don't understand the back end of that solution. Yeah. Mm. And it's a lot of technology that's driving it to, you know, to be able to understand what's in that basket because it, it's going to be a mixture of all sorts of things. Mm. So, you know, a huge amount of technology investment from the retailers that, you know, certainly us as consumers don't really understand because we don't look at that journey in any detail. Yeah. You know, we certainly don't think about when we place an order online, what goes on to get that order to your door. Yeah. And it's technology that drives all of it. So I think certainly over the next two, three years, we're going to see, you know, retail trends changing, retail investments changing, and Definitely. consumer behaviour getting more and more, you know, demanding. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's why these stories that, you know, certainly we're seeing right now are just the beginning of the investment mm -hmm. platform we'll see from retail. Well, I think that kind of wraps it up. So thank you very much for joining us, Raj. It's been, been a, a pleasure. pleasure chatting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.